don't just read ncert listen it and feel it physics textbook of class 12th part 2 chapter 14 semiconductor electronics material devices and simple circuits narrated by isna rafat khan introduction devices in which a controlled flow of electrons can be obtained are the basic building blocks of all electronic circuits Before the discovery of the transistor in 1948 such devices were mostly vacuum tubes also called the valves like the vacuum diodes which had two electrodes anode and cathode triode which has three electrodes cathode plate and grid tetrode and pentode respectively with four and five electrodes in a vacuum The electrons are supplied by a heated cathode and a controlled flow of these electrons in vacuum is obtained by varying the voltage between its different electrodes. Vacuum is required in the interelectrode space otherwise the moving electrons may lose their energy on the collision with the air molecules in their path. In these devices the electron flow only from cathode to anode that is only in one direction therefore such devices are generally referred to as valves these vacuum tubes devices are bulky consume high power operate generally at high voltage and have limited life and low reliability The seed of development of modern solid state semiconductor electronics goes back to 1930s when it was realized that some solid state semiconductors and their junctions offer the possibility of controlling the numbers and the direction of flow of charge carriers through them simple excitations like light heat or small applied voltage can change the number of mobile charges in the semiconductor note that the supply and the flow of charge carriers in the semiconductor devices are within the solid itself while in the earlier vacuum tubes or valves the mobile electrons were obtained from a heated cathode and they were made to flow in an evacuated space or vacuum no external heating or large evacuated space is required by the semiconductor devices they are small in size consume low power operate at low voltage and have long life and high reliability even the cathode ray tube used in the television and computer monitors which work on the principle of the vacuum tubes are being replaced by the liquid crystal display monitors with supporting solid state electronics much before the full implication of the semiconductor devices was formally understood a naturally occurring crystal of galena lead sulfide pbs with a metal point contact attached to it was used as a detector of radio waves in the following sections we will introduce the basic concepts of the semiconductor physics and discuss some semiconductor devices like junction diodes and bipolar junction transistor a few circuit illustrating their applications will also be described classification of metals conductors and semiconductors on the basis of conductivity on the basis of relative values of the electrical conductivity or resistivity the solids are broadly classified as metals semiconductors and insulators metals they possess very low resistivity or high conductivity resistivity is equals to 10 to the power minus 2 to 10 to the power minus 8 ohm meter conductivity is approximately equal to 10 to the power 2 to 10 to the power 8 simon per meter semiconductors they have resistivity or conductivity intermediate to metals and insulators resistivity is approximately equal to 10 to the power minus 5 to 10 to the power 6 ohm meter conductivity is approximately equal to 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power minus 6 simon per meter 
insulators they have high resistivity or low conductivity resistivity is approximately equal to 10 to the power 11 to 10 to the power 19 ohm meter conductivity is approximately equal to 10 to the power minus 11 to 10 to the power minus 19 simon per meter the value of resistivity and conductivity given above are indicative of the magnitude and could well go outside the ranges as well. Relative values of the resistivity are not the only criteria for distinguishing metal insulators and semiconductors from each other. There are some other differences which will become clear as we go along in this chapter. Our interest in this chapter is in the study of semiconductors which could be elemental semiconductor or compound semiconductors. Compound semiconductors example are inorganic, organic and organic polymers. Elemental semiconductors silicon and germanium. Compound semiconductors in organic CDS, GAAS, CDSE, INP, etc. Organic anthracene, doped thylocyanins, etc. Organic polymers, polypyrrole, polyalanine, polythiophene, etc. Most of the currently available semiconductor devices are based on the elemental semiconductor silicon or germanium and compound inorganic semiconductors. However, after 1990, a few semiconductor devices using organic semiconductors and semiconducting polymers have been developed, signaling the birth of a futuristic technology of the polymer electronics and the molecular electronics. In this chapter, we will restrict ourselves to the study of the inorganic semiconductors, particularly elemental semiconductors, silicon and germanium. The general concepts introduced here for discussing the elemental semiconductors by and large apply to most of the compound semiconductors as well. On the basis of energy bands, according to the Bohr atomic model in an isolated atom, the energy of any of its electron is decided by the orbit in which it revolves. But when the atoms come together to form a solid, they are close to each other, so the outer orbits of the electrons from neighboring atoms would come very close or could even overlap. This would make the nature of electron motion in a solid very different from that in an isolated atom. Inside the crystal, each electron has a unique position and no two electrons see exactly the same pattern of the surrounding charges. Because of this, each electron will have a different energy level. These different energy levels with a continuous energy variation form what are called the energy bands. The energy bands which include the energy levels of the valence electrons is called the valence band. The energy bands above the valence band is called the conduction band. With no external energy, all the valence electron will reside in the valence band. If the lowest level in the conduction band happens to be lower than the high level of the valence band, the electron from the valence band can easily move to the conduction band. Normally, the conduction band is empty, but when it overlaps on the valence band, electrons can move freely into it. This is the case with the metallic conductors. If there is some gap between the conduction band and the valence band, the electron in the valence band all remain bound and no free electrons are available in the conduction band. This makes the material an insulator, but some of the electrons from the valence band may gain external energy to cross the gap between the conduction band and the valence band. Then these electrons will move into the conduction band. At the same time, they will create a vacant energy level in the valence band where other valence electrons can move. Thus, the process creates the possibility of conduction due to the electrons in the conduction band as well as due to the vacancies in the valence band. Let us consider what happens in the case of the silicon or germanium crystals containing N atoms. For silicon, the outermost orbit is the third orbit N3, while for germanium, it is the fourth orbit N is equals to 4. The number of electrons in the outermost orbit is 4. 
Hence, the total number of the outer electrons in the crystal is 4n. The maximum possible number of electrons in the outer orbit is 8, 2s plus 6p electrons. So, for the 4n valence electrons, there are 8 available energy states. These 8n discrete energy levels can either form a continuous band or they may be grouped into different bands depending upon the distance between the atoms on the crystal. At the distance between the atoms in the crystal lattice of the silicon and germanium, the energy band of these 8n states is split apart into which are separated by an energy gap e.g. The lower band which is completely occupied by the 4n valence electron at the temperature of absolute zero is the valence band. The other band consisting of 4n energy states called the conduction band is completely empty at absolute zero. Band theory for solids Consider that the silicon or germanium crystals contain n atoms. Electrons of each atom will have discrete energy in the different orbits. The electron energy will be the same if all the atoms are isolated, that is separated from each other by a large distance. However, in a crystal, the atoms are close to each other and therefore the electrons interact with each other and also with the neighboring atomic codes. The overlap or interaction will be more felt by the electrons in the outermost orbit while the inner orbit or the core electron energies may remain unaffected. Therefore, for understanding electron energies in silicon or germanium crystal, we need to consider the changes in the energies of the electrons in the outermost orbit only. For silicon, the outermost orbit is the third orbit n is equals to 3 while for germanium it is the fourth orbit n is equals to 4. The number of electrons in the outermost orbit is 4, 2s and 2p electron. Hence, the total number of the outer electron in the crystal is 4n. The maximum possible number of the outer electrons in the orbit is 8. 2s plus 6p electrons. So out of the 4n electrons, 2n electrons are in the 2n s state, orbital quantum number L is equals to 0 and 2n electrons are available from 6n p states. Obviously, some p electrons states are empty and are shown in the extreme right of the figure. This is the case of well-separated or isolated systems, region A of figure. Suppose these atoms start coming nearer to each other to form a solid, the energies of the different electrons in the outermost orbit may change both increase or decrease due to the interaction between the electrons with the different atoms. The 6n state for the L is equals to 1 which originally had identical energies in the isolated atom spread out and form an energy band region b in the figure similarly the 2n state for l is equals to o having an identical energies in the isolated atoms split into the second band carefully see in the region b of figure separated from first one by the energy gap at still smaller spacing, however, there comes a region in which the band merge with each other. The lowest energy state that is a split from the upper atomic level appears to drop below the upper state that has come from the lower atomic level. In this region, region C in figure, no energy gap exists where the upper and the lower energy state gets mixed. Finally, if the distance between the atoms further decreases, the energy band again is split apart and are separated by the energy gap e.g. region D in the figure. The total number of the available energy state 8n has been reapportioned between the two bands, 4n states each in the lower and the upper energy bands. Here the significant point is that there are exactly as many states in the lower band 4n as there are available valence electrons from the atoms 4n. Therefore, this band called the valence band is completely filled while the upper band is completely empty. The upper band is called the conduction band. 
The lowest energy level in the conduction band is shown in figure as EC and the highest energy level in the valence band is shown as EV. Above EC and below EV, there is a large number of the closely spaced energy levels as shown in figure 14.1. The gap between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band is called the energy band gap, energy gap EG. It may be large, small or zero depending upon the material. These different situations are depicted in figure 14.2 as discussed below. Case 1. This refers to a situation as shown in figure 14.2a. One can have a metal either when the conduction band is partially filled and the balanced band is partially emptied or when the conduction and the valence band overlap. When there is an overlap, electron from the valence band can easily move into the conduction band. This situation makes a large number of the electron available for the electrical conduction. When the valence band is partially empty, the electron from its lower level can move to a higher level, making conduction possible. However, the resistance of such material is low or the conductivity is high. Case 2 In this case as shown in figure 14.2b, a large band gap e.g. exists, e.g. is greater than 3 electron volt. There are no electrons in the conduction band and therefore no electrical conduction is possible. Note that the energy gap is so large that the electrons cannot be excited from the valence band to the conduction band by the thermal excitation. This is the case of the insulators, case 3. This situation is shown in figure 14.2c. Here a finite but a small band gap e.g. is less than 3 electron volt exists because of the smaller band gap. At room temperature, some of the electrons from the valence band can acquire enough energy to cross the energy band gap and enter the conduction band. Hence, the resistance of the semiconductor is not as high as of the insulator. In this section, we have made a broad classification of metals, conductors and semiconductors. In the section which follows, you will learn the conduction process in semiconductors. Intrinsic Semiconductors We shall take most common case of germanium and silicon whose lattice structure is shown in figure 14.3. These structures are called the diamond-like structures. Each atom is surrounded by four nearest neighbors. We know that silicon and germanium have four valence electrons. In its crystalline structure, every silicon or germanium atom tends to share one of its four valence electrons with each of its four nearest neighbor atoms and also to take share of one electron from one such neighbor. These shared electrons part are referred to as forming a covalent bond or simply a valence bond. The two shared electrons can be assumed to shuttle back and forth between the associated atoms holding them together strongly. Figure 14.4 schematically shows the two-dimensional representation of the silicon and germanium structure shown in figure 14.3 which overemphasizes the covalent bond. It shows that an idealized picture in which no bonds are broken, all bonds are intact, such a situation arises at low temperature. As the temperature increases, more thermal energy becomes available to these electrons and some of these electrons may break away, becoming free electrons contributing to conduction. The thermal energy effectively ionizes only a few atoms in the crystalline lattice and creates a vacancy in the bond as shown in figure 14.5a. The neighborhood from which the free electron with a charge minus q has come out leaves a vacancy with an effective charge plus q. This vacancy with effective positive electronic charge is called a hole. The hole behaves as an apparent free particle with the effective positive charge.
In intrinsic semiconductors, the number of free electrons Ne is equal to the number of holes NH, that is Ne is equals to NH is equals to Ni, where Ni is the intrinsic carrier concentration. Semiconductors possess the unique property in which, apart from electrons, the holes also move. Suppose there is a hole at site 1 as shown in figure 14.5a. The movements of hole can be visualized as shown in figure 4.5b. An electron from covalent bond at site 2 may jump to the vacant site 1. Thus, after such a jump, the hole is at site 2 and site 1 has now an electron. Therefore, apparently, the hole has moved from site 1 to site 2. Note that the electron originally set free is not involved in the process of hole motion. The free electron moves completely independently as conducting electron and gives rise to the electron current, i.e. under an applied electric field. Remember that the motion of hole is not only a convenient way of describing the actual motion of bound electrons, however there is an empty bond anywhere in the crystal. Under the action of a electric field, these holes move towards the negative potential, giving a hole current IH. The total current I is the sum of the electron current IE and the hole current IH. I is equals to IE plus IH. It may be noted that apart from the process of generation of conduction electrons and holes, a simultaneous process of free combination occurs in which the electron recombine with holes. At equilibrium, the rate of generation is equal to the rate of recombination of charge carriers. The recombination occurs due to an electron colliding with a hole. An intrinsic semiconductor will behave like an insulator at T is equals to 0 Kelvin, as shown in figure 14.6a. It is the thermal energy at higher temperatures T more than 0 K, which excites some electrons from the valence band to conduction band. These thermally excited electrons at T more than 0 K partially occupy the conduction band. Therefore, the energy band diagram of an intrinsic semiconductor will be shown in figure 14.6b. Here, some electrons are shown in the conduction band. These have come from the valence band, leaving equal number of holes there. Extrinsic semiconductors The conductivity of an intrinsic semiconductor depends on its temperature, but at room temperature, its conductivity is very low. As such, no important electronic devices can be developed using these semiconductors. Hence, there is a necessity of improving their conductivity. This can be done by making the use of impurities. When a small amount, say a few parts per million, of a suitable impurity is added to the pure conductor, the conductivity of the semiconductor is increased manifold. Such materials are known as extrinsic semiconductors or the impurity semiconductors. The deliberate addition of a desirable impurity is called doping and the immunity atoms are called dopants. Such a material is called a doped semiconductor. The doped has to be such that it does not distort the original pure semiconductor lattice. It occupies only a few of the original semiconductor atom sites in the crystal. A necessary condition to attain this is that the site of the dopant and the semiconductor atoms should be nearly the same. There are two types of dopants used in doping the tetravalent silicon or germanium. One, Pentavalent valency 5 like arsenic, antimony, phosphorus, etc. Trivalent valency 3 like indium, boron, aluminium, etc. We shall now discuss how the doping changes the number of charge carriers of semiconductors. 
Silicon or germanium belongs to the fourth group in the periodic table and therefore we chose the dopant element from nearby fifth or third group expecting and taking care that of the size of dopant atom is nearly the same as that of silicon or germanium interestingly the pentavalent and trivalent dopants in silicon or germanium give two entirely different types of conductors as discussed below the n type conductor suppose we dope silicon or germanium with a pentavalent element as shown in figure 14.7 when an atom of plus 5 valency element occupies the position of an atom in the crystal lattice of silicon four of its electron bond with the four silicon neighbors while the fifth remains very weakly bound to its parent atom this is because the four electrons participating in the bonding are seen as a part of effective core of the atom by the fifth electron as a result the ionization energy required to set the electron free is very small and even at room temperatures it will be free to move in the lattice of semiconductor for example the energy required is approximately equal to 0.01 electron volt for germanium and 0.05 electron volt for silicon to separate this electron from its atom this in contrast to the energy required to jump the forbidden band that is about 0.72 electron volt for germanium and about 1.1 electron volt for silicon at room temperature in intrinsic semiconductor thus the pentavalent dopant is donating one extra electron for conduction and hence is known as the donor impurity the number of electrons made available for conduction by dopant atom depends strongly upon the doping level and is independent of any increase in ambient temperature on the other hand the number of free electrons with an equal number of holes generated by silicon atom increases weakly with temperature in a doped semiconductor the total number of conduction electron ne is due to the electrons contributed by donor and those generated intrinsically while the total number of holes and h is only due to the holes from the intrinsic source but the rate of recombination of holes would increase due to the increase in the number of electrons as a result the number of holes would get reduced further Thus with the proper level of doping the number of conduction electrons can be made much larger than the number of holes hence in an extrinsic semiconductor doped with pentavalent impurity electrons become the majority carriers and holes the minority carriers these semiconductors are therefore known as n type semiconductors for n type semiconductors we have number of electrons n e much much greater than n holes 2 p type semiconductors this is obtained when silicon or germanium is doped with the trivalent impurity like aluminium boron indium etc the dopant has one valence electron less than silicon or germanium and therefore this atom can form covalent bond with the neighboring three silicon atoms but does not have an electron to offer to the fourth silicon atom so the bond between the fourth neighbor and the trivalent atom has a vacancy or hole as shown in figure 14.8 since the neighboring silicon atom in the lattice want an electron in place of a hole an electron in the outer orbit of an atom in the neighborhood may jump to fill this vacancy leaving a vacancy or hole at its own site thus the hole is available for conduction note that the trivalent foreign atom becomes effectively negatively charged when it shares fourth electron with the neighboring silicon atom therefore the dopant atom of p type material can be treated as core of one negative charge along with its associated hole as shown in figure 14.8b it is obvious that one acceptor atom gives one hole these hole are in addition 
to the intrinsically generated holes while the source of conduction electron is only intrinsic generation. Thus, for such a material, the holes are majority carriers and electrons are minority carriers. Therefore, extrinsic semiconductors doped with trivalent impurity are called p-type semiconductors. For p-type semiconductors, the recombination process will reduce the number ni of intrinsically generated electrons to ne. We have for p-type semiconductors nh much greater than ne. Note that the crystal maintains an overall charge neutrality as the charge of additional charge carriers is just equal and opposite to that of ionized cores in the lattice. In extrinsic semiconductors, because of the abundance of majority current carriers, the minority carrier produced thermally have more chance of meeting majority carriers and thus getting destroyed. Hence the dopant by adding a large number of current carriers of one type which become the majority carriers indirectly helps to reduce the intrinsic concentration of minority carriers. The semiconductor's energy band structure is affected by doping. In the case of extrinsic semiconductors, additional energy states due to the donor impurities ED and acceptor impurities EA also exist. In the energy band diagram of N-type silicon semiconductor, the donor energy level ED is slightly below the bottom EC of the conduction band and electrons from this level move into the conduction band with very small supply of energy. At room temperature, most of the donor atoms get ionized but very few, around 10 to the power minus 12 atoms of silicon get ionized. So, the conduction band will have most electrons coming from donor impurities as shown in figure 14.9a. Similarly, for p-type semiconductor, the acceptor energy level Ea is slightly above the top Ev of the valence bands as shown in figure 14.9b. With very small supply of energy, an electron from the valence band can jump to the level Ea and ionize the acceptor negatively. Alternately, we can also say that with a very small supply of energy, the hole from level Ea sinks down into the valence band. Electrons rise up and holes fall down when they gain external energy. At room temperature, most of the acceptor atoms get ionized, leaving holes in the valence band. Thus, at room temperature, the density of the holes in the valence band is predominantly due to the impurity in the extrinsic semiconductor. The electron and hole concentration in a semiconductor in thermal equilibrium is given by Ne into NH is equals to Ni square. Though the above description is grossly approximate and hypothetical, it helps in understanding the difference between metals, insulators and semiconductors, intrinsic and extrinsic, in a simple manner. The difference in the resistivity of carbon, silicon and germanium depends upon the energy gap between their conduction and valence bands. For carbon, silicon and germanium, the energy gaps are 5.4 electron volt, 1.1 electron volt and 0.7 electron volt respectively. SN also is a 4 group element but it is a metal because the energy gap in its case is 0 electron volt. PN junction A PN junction is the basic building block of many semiconductor devices like diodes, transistor, etc. A clear understanding of the junction behavior is important to analyze the working of other semiconductor devices. We will now try to understand how a junction is formed and how the junction behaves under the influence of the external applied voltage also called the bias. P-N junction formation Consider a thin P-type silicon semiconductor wafer. By adding precisely a small quantity of the pentavalent impurity, part of PSI wafer can be converted into NSI. There are several processes by which a semiconductor can be formed. The wafer now contains P region and the N region 
and a metallurgic junction between the P and N region. The two important processes occur during the formation of a PN junction, diffusion and drift. We know that in an n-type semiconductor, the concentration of electrons, number of electrons per unit volume is more compared to the concentration of holes. Similarly, in a p-type semiconductor, the concentration of holes is more than concentration of electrons. During the formation of P N junction and due to the concentration gradient across P and N sides, holes diffuses from the P side to the N side and electrons diffuses from the N side to the P side. This motion of charge carriers gives rise to the diffusion current across the junction. When an electron diffuses from N to P, it leaves behind an ionized donor on the N side. This ionized donor positive charge is immobile as it is bonded to the surrounding atoms. As the electron continue to diffuse from N to P, a layer of positive charge or positive space charge region on N side of the junction is developed. Similarly, when a hole diffuses from P to N, due to the concentration gradient, it leaves behind an ionized acceptor negative charge which is immobile. As the hole continue to diffuse, a layer of negative charge or negative space charge region on P side of the junction is developed. This space charge region on the other side of the junction together is known as the depletion region. As the electron and holes taking part in the initial movement across the junction depleted the region of its free charges. The thickness of the depletion region is of the order of one tenth of a micrometer. Due to the positive space charge region on the N side of the junction and negative space region on the P side of the junction, an electric field directed from positive charge towards the negative charge develops. Due to this field, an electron on P side of the junction moves to the N side and a hole on N side of the junction moves to the P side. The motion of charge carriers due to the electric field is called drift. Thus, a drift current which is opposite in direction to diffusion current starts. Initially, diffusion current is large and drift current is small. As the diffusion process continues, the space charge regions on the either side of the junction extend, thus increasing the electric field strength and hence drift current. This process continues until the diffusion current equals the drift current. Thus, a p-n junction is formed. In a p-n junction, under equilibrium, there is no net current. The loss of electron from the n region and gain of electron by the p region causes a difference of potential across the junction of the two regions. The polarity of this potential is such as to oppose further flow of the carriers so that a condition of equilibrium exists. Figure 14.11 shows the p-n junction at equilibrium and the potential across the junction. The n material has lost electrons and p material has acquired electrons. The n material is thus positive relative to the p material. Since this potential tends to prevent the movement of the electron from the n region to the p region, it is often called as the barrier potential. Semiconductor Diode A semiconductor diode is basically a p-n junction with metallic contacts provided at the ends of the application of external voltage. It is a two-terminal device. A p-n junction diode is symbolically represented as shown in figure 14.12b. The direction of the arrow indicates the conventional direction of current when the diode is under forward bias. The equilibrium barrier potential can be altered by applying an external voltage V across the diode. The situation of P-N junction diode under equilibrium without bias is shown in figure 14.11 A and B. P-N junction diode under forward bias when an external voltage V is applied across a semiconductor diode such that P side is connected to the positive terminal of the battery and N side to the negative terminal, it is said to be forward biased. 
The applied voltage mostly drops across the depletion region and voltage drop across the P side and N side of the junction is negligible. This is because the resistance of the depletion region, a region where there are no charges, is very high compared to the resistance of N side and P side. The direction of the applied voltage is opposite to the built in potential V0. As a result, the depletion layer width decreases and barrier height is reduced. The effective barrier height under the forward bias is V0 minus V. If the applied voltage is small, the barrier potential will be reduced only slightly below the equilibrium value and only a small number of carriers in the material, those that happen to be in the uppermost energy levels, will possess enough energy to cross the junction. So the current will be small. If we increase the applied voltage significantly, the barrier height will be reduced and more members of the carriers will have the required energy, thus the current increases. Due to the applied voltage, electron from the N side cross the depletion region and reach the P side, where they are minority carriers. Similarly, holes from the P side cross the junction and reaches the N side, where they are minority carriers. This process under forward bias is known as the minority carrier injection. At the junction boundary on each side, the minority carrier concentration increases significantly compared to the location far from the junction. Due to this concentration gradient, the injected electrons on the P side diffuses from the junction edge of P side to the other end of P side. Likewise, the injected holes on the N side diffuse from the junction edge of N side to the other end of N side. This motion of charged carriers on the either side give rise to current. The total diode forward current is the sum of hole diffusion current and conventional current due to the electron diffusion. The magnitude of this current is usually in milliamperes. PN junction diode under reverse bias. When an external voltage V is applied across the diode such that N side is positive and P side is negative, it is said to be reverse biased. The applied voltage mostly drops across the depletion region. The direction of the applied voltage is same as the direction of the barrier potential. As a result, the barrier height increases and the depletion region widens due to the change in the electric field. The effective barrier height under reverse bias is V0 plus V. This suppresses the flow of electrons from N to P and holes from P to N. Thus, diffusion current decreases enormously compared to the diode under forward bias. The electric field direction of the junction is such that if electrons on the P side or holes on the N side in their random motion comes close to the junction, they will be swept to its majority zone. This drift of the carriers gives rise to the current. The drift current is of the order of a few microamperes. This is quite low. It is due to the motion of carriers from the minority side to their majority side across the junction. The drift current is also there under forward bias, but it is negligible. Microamperes when compared to the current due to the injected carriers, which is usually in milliamperes. The diode reverse current is not very much dependent on the applied voltage. Even a small voltage is sufficient to sweep the minority carriers from the one side of the junction to the other side of the junction. The current is not limited by the magnitude of the applied voltage but is limited due to the concentration of the minority carriers on the either side of the junction. The current under reverse bias is essentially voltage independent up to a critical reverse bias voltage known as the breakdown voltage. When V is equals to VBR, the diode reverse current increases sharply. Even a slight increase in the bias voltage causes a large change in the current. If the reverse current is not limited by an external circuit below the rated value specified by the manufacturer, the PN junction will get destroyed. Once it exceeds the rated value, the diode gets destroyed due to overheating. 
This can happen even for the diode under forward bias if the forward current exceeds the rated value. The current arrangement for studying VI characteristic of a diode that is the variation of current as a function of applied voltage are shown in figure 14.16A and B. The battery is connected to the diode through a potentiometer or rheostat so that the applied voltage to the diode can be changed. For different values of voltage, the value of current is noted. A graph between V and I is obtained as in figure 14.16C. Note that the forward bias measurement, we use a milliameter since expected current is large as explained in earlier section, while a macroameter is used in the reverse bias to measure a current. You can see in figure 14.16c that in the forward bias the current first increases very slowly, almost negligibly, till the voltage across the diode crosses a certain value. After a characteristic voltage, the diode current increases significantly or exponentially. Even a very small increase in the diode bias voltage, this increase occurs. This voltage is called the threshold voltage or cut-in voltage. It is around 0.2 volt for germanium diode and 0.7 volt for silicon diode. For diode in the reverse bias, the current is very small in microamperes and almost remains constant with change in bias. It is called the reverse saturation current. However, for special cases at very high reverse bias, breakdown voltage the current suddenly increases. This special action of the diode is discussed later in section 14.8. The general purpose diode are not used beyond the reverse saturation current region. The above discussion shows that the PN junction diode primarily allows the flow of current only in one direction, forward bias. The forward bias resistance is low as compared to the reverse bias resistance. This property is used for rectification of AC voltage as discussed in next section. For diodes, we define a quantity called the dynamic resistance as the ratio of a small change in the voltage delta V to small change in the current delta I. Rd is equals to delta V upon delta I. Application of junction diode as a rectifier from VI characteristic of a junction diode, we see that it allows current to pass only when it is forward biased. So if an alternating voltage is applied across a diode, the current flows only in that part of the cycle when the diode is forward biased. This property is used to rectify alternating voltage and the circuit used for this purpose is called a rectifier. If an alternating voltage is applied across a diode in series with a load, a pulsating voltage will appear across the load during the half cycles of the AC input during which the diode is forward biased. Such rectifier circuits as shown in figure 14.18 is called a half wave rectifier. A secondary of a transformer supplies to the desired AC voltage across terminals A and B. When the voltage at A is positive, the diode is forward biased and it conducts. When A is negative, the diode is reverse biased and it does not conduct. The reverse saturation current of a diode is negligible and can be considered equal to zero for practical purpose. The reverse breakdown voltage of the diode must be sufficiently higher than the peak AC voltage at the secondary of the transformer to protect the diode from the reverse breakdown. Therefore, in the positive half cycle of the AC, there is a current through the load resistor RL and we get an output voltage as shown in the figure 14.8b, whereas there is no current in the negative half cycle. In the next positive half cycle, again we get the output voltage. Thus the output voltage, though still varying, is restricted only to one direction and is said to be rectified. Since the rectified output of this circuit is only for half of the input AC waves, it is called the half wave rectifier. 
the circuit using the two diodes shown in figure 14.19a gives output rectified voltage corresponding to the both positive as well as negative half of the AC cycle. Hence, it is known as the full wave rectifier. Here, the P side of the two diodes as connected to the ends of the secondary of the transformer. The N side of the diodes are connected together and output is taken between these common points of the diode and midpoint of the secondary of the transformer. So for a full wave rectifier, the secondary of the transformer is provided with a center tapping and so it is called the center tap transformer. As can be seen from figure 14.19c, the voltage rectified by each diode is only half the total secondary voltage. Each diode rectifies only for half the cycle, but the two do so for alternate cycles. Thus the output between their common terminals and the center tap of the transformer becomes a full wave rectifier output. Note that there is another circuit of the full wave rectifier which does not need a center tap transformer but needs four diodes. Suppose the input voltage to A with respect to the center tap at any instant is positive. It is clear that at that instant voltage at B being out of phase will be negative as shown in figure 14.19b. So diode D1 gets forward biased and conducts while D2 being reverse biased is not conducting. Hence during this positive half cycle we get an output current and a output voltage across the load resistor RL as shown in figure 14.19c. In the course of the AC cycle when the voltage at A becomes negative with respect to the center tap, the voltage at B would be positive. In this part of the cycle diode D1 would not conduct but diode D2 would. Giving an output current and output voltage across RL during a negative half of the input AC, thus we get output voltage during both the positive as well as negative half of the cycle. Obviously, this is a more efficient circuit for getting rectified voltage or current than the half wave rectifier. The rectified voltage is in the form of the pulse of shape of half sinusoids. Though it is unidirectional, it does not have a steady value. To get a steady DC output from the pulsating voltage, normally a capacitor is connected across the output terminal parallel to the load RL. One can also use an inductor in the series with RL for the same purpose. Since these additional circuits appear to filter out the AC ripple and give a pure DC voltage so that they are called filters. Now we shall discuss the role of the capacitor in filtering. When the voltage across the capacitor is rising, it gets charged. If there is no external load, it remains charged to the peak voltage of the rectified output. When there is a load, it gets discharged through the load and the voltage across it begins to fall. In the next half cycle of the rectified output, it again gets discharged to the peak value. The rate of the fall of the voltage across the capacitor depends upon the inverse product of the capacitor C and the effective resistance RL used in the circuit and is also called the time constant. To make the time constant large, value of C should be large. So capacitor input filters use large capacitors. The output voltage obtained by using capacitor input filter is nearer to the peak voltage of the rectified voltage. This type of filter is most widely used in the power supplies. Special purpose PN junction diodes. In this section, we shall discuss some devices which are basically junction diodes but are developed for different applications. First, Zener diode. It is a special purpose semiconductor diode named after its inventor C. Zener. It is designed to operate under reverse bias in the breakdown region and used as a voltage regulator. The symbol for Zener diode is shown in figure 14.21a. Zener diode is fabricated by heavily doping both P and N side of the junction. Due to this, depletion region formed is very thin, less than 10 to the power minus 6 meters, and the electric field of the junction is extremely high. 
that is around 5 into 10 to the power 6 volt per meter. Even for a small reverse bias voltage of about 5 volts, the IV characteristic of a Zener diode is shown in figure 14.21b. It is seen that when the applied reverse bias voltage V reaches the breakdown voltage Vz of the Zener diode, there is a large change in the current. Note that after the breakdown voltage Vz, a large change in the current can be produced by almost insignificant change in the reverse bias voltage. In other words, Zener voltage remains constant. Even though current through the Zener diode varies over a wide range, this property of Zener diode is used for regulating supply voltage so that they are constant. Let us understand how reverse current suddenly increases at the breakdown voltage. We know that reverse current is due to the flow of electrons the minority carriers from P to N and holes from N to P. As the reverse bias voltage is increased, the electric field at the junction becomes significant. When the reverse bias voltage V is equal to Vz, then the electric field strength is high enough to pull valence electrons from the host atoms on the P side, which are accelerated to the N side. These electrons account for high current observed at the breakdown. The emission of electron from the host atoms due to the high electric field is known as internal field emission or field ionization. The electric field required for field ionization is of the order 10 to the power 6 volt per meter. Zener diode as a voltage regulator. We know that when the AC input voltage of a rectifier fluctuates, its rectified output also fluctuates. To get a constant DC voltage from the DC unregulated output of rectifier, we use a Zener diode. The circuit diagram of the voltage regulator using a Zener diode is shown in figure 14.22. The unregulated DC voltage filtered output of a rectifier is connected to the Zener diode through a series resistance RS such that the Zener diode is reverse biased. If the input voltage increases, the current through RS and the Zener diode also increases. This increases the voltage drop across RS without any change in the voltage across the Zener diode. This is because in the breakdown region, Zener voltage remains constant even though the current through the Zener diode changes. Similarly, if the input voltage decreases, the current through RS and the Zener diode also decreases. The voltage drop across the RS decreases without any change in the voltage across the Zener diode. Thus, any increase or decrease in the input voltage results in increase or decrease of the voltage drop across RS without any change in the voltage across the Zener diode. Thus, the Zener diode acts as a voltage regulator. We have to select the Zener diode according to the required output voltage and accordingly the series resistance RS. Optoelectronic junction devices We have seen so far how a semiconductor diodes behave under applied electrical inputs. In this section, we learn about the semiconductor diodes in which the carriers are generated by photons photo excitation. All these devices are called optoelectronic devices. We shall study the functioning of the following optoelectronic devices. 1. Photodiodes used for detecting optical signals photodetectors. 2. Light emitting diodes which convert electrical energy into light. 3. Photovoltaic devices which convert optical radiation into electricity. 1. Photodiode A photodiode is again a special purpose PN junction diode fabricated with a transparent window to allow light to fall on the diode. It is operated under reverse bias. When photodiode is illuminated with light or photons with energy H nu greater than the energy gap Eg of the semiconductor, the electron hole pair are generated due to the absorption of photons. The diode is fabricated such that the generation of EH pairs takes place in or near the depletion region of the diode. Due to the electric field of the junction electrons and holes are separated before they recombine. 
The direction of the electric field is such that the electrons reach N side and holes reach P side. Electrons are collected on the N side and holes are collected on the P side, giving rise to an EMF. When an external load is connected, current flows. The magnitude of the photocurrent depends on the intensity of incident light. Photocurrent is proportional to the incident light intensity. It is easier to observe the change in the current with change in the light intensity. If a reverse bias is applied, thus the photodiode can be used as a photodetector to detect optical signals. The circuit diagram used for the measurement of IV characteristics of a photodiode is shown in figure 14.23a and a typical IV characteristic in 14.23b. Light Emitting Diode it is a heavily doped p-n junction which under forward bias emits spontaneous radiation the diode is encapsulated with a transparent cover so that the emitted light can come out when the diode is forward bias electrons are sent from n to p where they are minority carriers and holes are sent from p to n where they are minority carriers at the junction boundary the concentration of minority carriers increases compared to the equilibrium condition that is when there is no bias thus at the junction boundary on the either side of the junction excess minority carriers are there which recombines with majority carriers near the junction. On recombination, the energy is released in the form of photons. Photons with energy equal to or slightly less than the band gap are emitted. When the forward current of the diode is small, the intensity of light emitted is small. As the forward current increases, intensity of light increases and reaches a maximum. Further, increase in the forward current results in the decrease of light intensity. LED are biased such that the light emitting efficiency is maximum. The VI characteristic of a LED is similar to that of the silicon junction diode, but the threshold voltage is much higher and is slightly different for each color. The reverse breakdown voltage of LED are very low, typically around 5 volt. So care should be taken that high reverse voltages do not appear across them. LEDs can emit red, yellow, orange, green and blue light are commercially available. The semiconductor used for fabrication of visible LED must at least have a band gap of 1.8 electron volts. The spectral range of visible light is from about 0.4 micrometer to 0.7 micrometer that is from about 3 electron volts to 1.8 electron volt. The compound semiconductor gallium arsenide phosphide is used for making LEDs for different colors. Gas P with EG around 1.9 electron volt is used for the red LED. Gas with EG around 1.4 electron volts is used to make infrared LED. Thus, LED find extensive use in the remote controls, burger alarm systems, optical communications, etc. Extensive research is being done for developing white LED, which can replace the incandescent lamps. LED have the following advantage over the conventional incandescent low power lamps 1. Low operational voltage and less power. 2. Fast action and no warm up required. 3. The bandwidth of the emitted light is 100 angstrom to 500 angstrom, or in other words, is nearly but not exactly monochromatic. 4. Long life and ruggedness. 5. Fast on off switching capability. 3. Solar cell. A solar cell is basically a p-n junction which generates EMF when the solar radiation falls on the p-n junction. It works on the same principle photovoltaic effect as the photodiode, except that it has no external bias applied and the junction area is kept much larger for solar radiation to be incident because we are interested in more power. A simple p-n junction solar cell is shown in figure 14.24. A p-silicon wafer, 
of about 300 micrometer is taken over which a thin layer of around 0.3 micrometers of N silicon is grown on one side by the diffusion process. The other side of the PSI is coated with a metal back contact. On the top of the N silicon layer, the metal finger electrode or the metallic grid is deposited. This acts as a front contact. The metallic grid occupies only a very small fraction of the cell area, less than 15%, so that the light can be incident on the cell from the top. The generation of EMF by the solar cell when light falls on is due to the following three basic process generation, separation and collection. 1. Generation of EH pairs due to light with H nu more than EG close to the junction. 2. Separation of electrons and holes due to the electric field of depletion region. Electrons are swept to N side and holes to the P side. 3. The electrons reaching the N side are collected by the front contact and holes reaching the P side are collected by the back contact. Thus, P side becomes positive and N side becomes negative, giving rise to the photovoltage. When an external load is connected as shown in figure 14.25a, a photocurrent IL flows through the load. A typical IV characteristic of a solar cell is shown in figure 14.25b. Note that the IV characteristic of solar cell is drawn in fourth quadrant of the coordinate axis. This is because the solar cell does not draw current but supplies to the same load. Semiconductors with band gap close to 1.5 electron volt are the ideal materials for the solar cell fabrication. Solar cells are made up of semiconductors like silicon, energy gap is equals to 1.1 electron volt, gas, energy gap is equals to 1.43 electron volt, etc. The important criteria for the selection of a material for the solar cell fabrication are 1. The band gap of around 1 to 1.8 electron volts. 2. High optical absorption of around 10 to the power 4 per centimeter. 3. Electrical conductivity. 4. Availability of the raw material. 5. Cost. Note that sunlight is not always required for a solar cell. Any light with the photon energies greater than the band gap will do. Solar cells are used to power electron devices in satellites and space vehicles and also as power supply to some calculators. Production of the low-cost photovoltaic cells for the large-scale solar energy is a topic for research. Junction Transistor The credit of inventing a transistor in the year 1947 goes to J. Bardeen and W. H. Bartain of the Bell Telephone Laboratories, USA. That transistor was a point-contact transistor. The first junction transistor consisting of two back-to-back PN junctions was invented by William Shockley in 1951. As long as only junction transistor was known, it was known simply as a transistor. But over the years, new types of transistor were invented and to differentiate it from the new ones, now it is called the bipolar junction transistor. Even now, Often the word transistor is used to mean BJT when there is no confusion. Since our study is limited to BJT, we shall use the word transistor for the BJT without any ambiguity. Transistor Structure and Action A transistor has three doped regions forming two PN junctions between them. Obviously, there are two types of transistors as shown in figure 14.27. One, NPN transistor, two, PNP transistor. NPN transistor. Here, two segments of N type semiconductor, emitter, and collector are separated by a segment of P type semiconductor base. PNP transistor. Here, two segments of P type semiconductor, termed as emitter and collector, are separated by a segment of N type semiconductor, termed as base. The schematic representation of an NPN and a PNP configuration are shown in figure 14.27a. 
all the three segments of the transistor have different thickness and their doping levels are also different. In the schematic symbols used for representing PNP and NPN transistor, the arrowhead shows the direction of the conventional current in the transistor. A brief description of these three segments of the transistor are given below. Emitter. This is the segment on one side of the transistor shown in figure 14.27a. It is of the moderate size and heavily doped. It supplies a large number of majority carriers for the current flow through the transistor. Base. This is the central segment. It is very thin and lightly doped. Collector. This segment collects a major portion of the majority carriers supplied by the emitter. The collector site is moderately doped and larger in size as compared to the emitter. We have seen earlier in the case of a PN junction that there is a formation of depletion region across the junction. In case of a transistor, depletion regions are formed at the emitter base junction and the base collector junction. For understanding the action of a transistor, we have to consider the nature of depletion regions formed at these junctions. The charge carriers move across the different regions of the transistor when proper voltage are applied across its terminals. The biasing of the transistor is done differentially for different uses. The transistor can be used in two distinct ways. Basically, it was invented to function as an amplifier a device which produces an enlarged copy of a signal, but later its use as a switch acquired equal importance. We shall study both these functions and the ways of the transistor is biased to achieve these mutually exclusive functions. First, we shall see what gives the transistor its amplifying capability. The transistor works as an amplifier. With its emitter base junction forward biased and the base collector junction reversed bias. This situation is shown in figure 14.28, where VCC and VEE are used for creating the respective biasing. When the transistor is biased in this way, it is said to be in its active state. V represent the voltage between the emitter and base as VEB and that between the collector and base as VCB. In figure 14.28, base is a common terminal for the two power supplies whose other terminals are connected to the emitter and collector respectively. So the two power supplies are represented as VEE and VCC respectively. In circuits where emitter is common terminal, the power supply between the base and the emitter is represented as VBB and between the collector and emitter as VCC. Let us see now the path of the current carriers and the transistor with emitter base junction forward biased and the base collector junction reverse biased. The heavy doped emitter has a high concentration of majority carriers which will be holes in a PNP transistor and electrons in an NPN transistor. These majority carriers enter the base region in large numbers. The base is thin and lightly doped, so the majority carriers there would be few. In a PNP transistor, the majority carriers in the base are electron since base is of n-type semiconductor. The large number of holes entering the base from the emitter swamps the small number of electrons there. As the base collector junction is reverse biased, these holes which appear as minority carriers at their junction can easily cross the junction and enter the collector. The holes in the base could move either towards the base terminal to combine with electrons entering from outside or cross the junction to enter the collector and reach the collector terminal. The base is made thin so that the most of the holes find themselves near the reverse biased base collector junction and so cross the junction instead of moving to the base terminal. It is interesting to note that due to the forward bias, a large current enters the emitter base junction, but most of it is diverted to adjacent reverse bias base collector junction, and the current coming out of the base becomes a very small fraction of the current that entered the junction. If we represent the whole current and the electron current crossing the forward bias junction, 
by IH and IE respectively, then the total current in a forward bias diode is the sum IH plus IE. We see that the emitter current IE is equals to IH plus IE, but the base current IB is much much less than IH plus IE because a major part of IE goes to the collector instead of coming out of the base terminal. The base current is thus a small fraction of the emitter current. The current entering into the emitter from outside is equal to the emitter current IE. Similarly, the current emerging from the base terminal is IB and that from the collector terminal is IC. It is obvious from the above description and also from a straightforward application of Kirchhoff's law to figure 14.28a that the emitter current is the sum of the collector current and the base current, IE is equals to IC plus IB. We also see that IC is around equal to IE. Our description of the direction of motion of the holes is identical with the direction of the conventional current, but the direction of motion of electrons is just opposite to that of the current. Thus, in a PNP transistor, the current enters from emitter into base, whereas in an NPN transistor, it enters from the base into emitter. The arrowhead in the emitter shows the direction of the conventional current. The description about the path followed by the majority and minority carriers in an NPN is exactly the same as that of PNP transistor. But the current paths are exactly opposite as shown in figure. In figure 14.28b, the electrons are the majority carriers supplied by the N-type emitter region. They cross the thin P-base region and are able to reach the collector to give the collector current IC. From the above description, we can conclude that in the active state of the transistor of emitter base junction acts as a low resistance while the base collector acts as a high resistance. Basic Transistor Circuit Configurations and Transistor Characteristics In a transistor, only three terminals are available, emitter, base and collector. Therefore, in a circuit, the input-output connections have to be such that one of these E, B or C is common to both the input and the output. Accordingly, the transistor can be connected in either of the following three configurations. Common emitter, common base, common collector. The transistor is most widely used in the common emitter configuration and we shall restrict our discussion to only this configuration. Since more commonly used transistors are NPN, silicon transistors, we shall confine our discussion to such transistors only. With PNP transistors, the polarity of the external power supplies are to be inverted. Common emitter transistor characteristics. When a transistor is used in the CE configuration, the input is between the base and the emitter and the output is between the collector and emitter. The variation of the base current IB with the base emitter voltage VBE is called the input characteristic. Similarly, the variation of the collector current IC with the collector emitter voltage VCE is called the output characteristic. You will see that the output characteristics are controlled by the input characteristics. This implies that the collector current changes with the base current. The input and the output characteristic of such an NPN transistor can be studied by using the current shown in figure 14.29. To study the output characteristics of the transistor in CE configuration, a curve is plotted between the base current IB against the base emitter voltage VBE. The collector emitter voltage VCE is kept while studying the dependence of IB on VBE. We are interested to obtain the input characteristic when the transistor is in active state. So, the collector emitter voltage VCE is kept large enough to make the base collector junction reverse biased. Since VCE is equals to VCB plus VBE and for silicon transistor VBE is 0.6 to 0.7 volt, VCE must be sufficiently larger than 0.7 volts. 
since the transistor is operated as an amplifier over large range of VCE, the reverse bias across the base collector junction is high most of the time. Therefore, the input characteristic may be obtained for VCE somewhere in the range of 3 volts to 20 volts. Since the increase in VCE appears as the increase in VCB, its effect on the IB is negligible. As a consequence, input characteristics for various values of VCE will give most identical curves. Hence, it is enough to determine only one output characteristics. The input characteristics of the transistor is shown in the figure 14.30a. The output characteristic is obtained by observing the variation of IC as VCE is varied keeping the IB constant. It is obvious that if the VBE is increased by a small amount, both whole current from the emitter region and the electron current from the base region will increase. As a consequence, both IB and IC will increase proportionately. This shows that when IB increases, IC also increases. The plot of IC versus VCE for different fixed values of IB gives one output characteristic. So there will be different output characteristics corresponding to the different values of IB as shown in the figure. The linear segments of both the outputs and the input characteristics can be used to calculate some important AC parameters of the transistor as shown below. Input resistance Ri. This is defined as the ratio of change in the base emitter voltage delta VBE to the resulting change in the base current delta IB at the constant collector emitter voltage VCE. This is dynamic AC resistance and as can be seen from the input characteristic, its value varies with the operating current in the transistor. Ri is equals to delta VBE divided by delta IB. The value of Ri can be anything from a few hundreds of a few thousand ohms. 2. Output resistance RO. This is defined as the ratio of change in the collector emitter voltage delta VCE to the change in the collector current delta IC at a constant base current IB. RO is equals to delta VCE divided by delta IC. The output characteristics show that initially for a very small value of VCE, IC increases almost linearly. This happens because the base collector junction is not reverse biased and the transistor is not active state. In fact, the transistor is in the saturation state and the current is controlled by the supply of the voltage VCC is equals to VCE in this part of the characteristic. When VCE is more than the required to the reverse bias the base collector junction, IC increases very little with VCE. The reciprocal of the slope of the linear part of the output characteristic gives the value of RO. The output resistance of the transistor is mainly controlled by the bias of the base collector junction. The high magnitude of the output resistance of the order of 100 kilo ohm is due to the reverse biased state of this diode. This also explains why the resistance in the initial part of the characteristic when the transistor is in saturation state is very low. 3. Current Amplification Factor B It is defined as the ratio of the change in the collector current to the change in the base current at a constant collector emitter voltage OECE when the transistor is in the active state. Beta AC is equals to delta IC divided by delta IB. This is also known as the small signal current gain and its value is very large. If we simply find the ratio of IC and IB, we get what is called the DC beta of the transistor. Hence, BDC is equals to IC divided by IB. Since IC increases with IB, almost linearly and IC is equals to zero. When the IB is equals to zero, the values of both beta DC and the beta AC are nearly equal. So for most calculations, beta DC can be used. Both beta AC and beta DC vary with VCE and IB or IC slightly. 
transistor as a device. The transistor can be used as a device application depending on the configuration used, namely CB, CC and CE, and the biasing of the EB and the BC junction, and the operation region namely cutoff, active region and saturation. As mentioned earlier, we have confined only to a CE configuration and will be concentrating on the biasing and operation region to understand the working of a device. When the transistor is used in cutoff or saturation state, it acts as a switch. On the other hand, for the using transistor, as an amplifier, it has to operate in an active region. 1. Transistor as a switch we shall try to understand the operation of a transistor as a switch by analyzing the behavior of the base bias transistor in CE configuration, as shown in figure 14.31a, applying Kirchhoff's voltage rule to the input and the output sides of the circuit, we get VBB is equals to IBRB plus VBE and VCE is equals to VCC minus ICRC. We shall treat VB as DC input voltage VI and VCE as the DC output voltage VO. So we have VI is equals to IBRB plus VBE and VO is equals to VCC minus ICRC. Let us now see how VO changes as VI increases from zero onwards. In the case of silicon transistor, as long as the input VI is less than 0.6 volt, the transistor will be in cut-off state and the current IC will be zero. Hence, V output is equals to VCC. When VI becomes greater than 0.6 volt, the transistor is in active state with some current IC in the output path and the output VO decreases as the term ICRC increases. With increase of VI, IC increases almost linearly and so VO decreases linearly till its value becomes less than about 1 volt. Beyond this, the change becomes non-linear and transistor goes into saturation state. With further increase in VI, the output voltage is found to decrease further towards zero, though it may never become zero. If we plot the VO versus VI curve, also the characteristic of the base bias transistor, we see that between cutoff state and the active state and also between the active state and saturation state there are regions of non-linearity showing that transition from a cutoff state to active state and from active state to saturation state are not sharply defined let us see now how the transistor is operated as a switch as long as vi is low and unable to forward bias the transistor VO is high at VCC. If VI is high enough to drive the transistor into saturation, then VO is low, very near to zero. When the transistor is not conducting, it is said to be switched off. When it is driven into saturation, it is said to be switched on. This shows that if we define low and high state as below, above the certain voltage levels corresponding to cut off and saturation of transistor, then we can say that a low input switch the transistor off and the high input switch it on. Alternatively, we can say that a low input to transistor gives a high input and a high input gives a low output. The switching circuits are designed in such a way that transistor does not remain in active state. 2. Transistor as an amplifier for using the transistor as an amplifier, we will use the active region for the VO versus VI curve. The slope of the linear part of the curve represents the rate of the change of the output with the input. It is negative because the output is VCC minus ICRC and not ICRC. That is why as input voltage of the CE amplifier increases, 
its output voltage decreases and the output is said to be out of phase with the input. If we consider delta VO and delta VI as small changes in the output and input voltage, then delta VO by delta VI is called the small signal voltage gain AV of the amplifier. If the VBB voltage has a fixed value corresponding to the midpoint of the active region, the circuit will behave as CE amplifier, with voltage gain delta VO by delta VI. We can express the voltage gain AV in terms of the resistors in the circuit and the current gain of the transistor as follows. So we have VO is equals to VCC minus ICRC. Therefore, delta VO is equals to 0 minus RC delta IC. Similarly, from VI is equals to IB RB plus VBE. But delta VBE is negligibly small in comparison to delta IB RB in this circuit. So the voltage gain in this CE amplifier is given by AV is equals to minus RC delta IC divided by RB delta IB where beta AC is equal to delta IC by delta IB from this equation. Thus the linear portion of the active region of the transistor can be exploited for the use in amplifier. Transistor as an amplifier CE configuration is discussed in details in the next section. Transistor as an amplifier CE configuration To operate the transistor as an amplifier, it is necessary to fix its operating point somewhere in the middle of its active region. If we fix the value of VBB corresponding to a point in the middle of the linear part of the transfer curve, then the DC base current IB would be constant and corresponding collector current IC will also be constant. The DC voltage VCE is equals to VCC minus ICRC would also remain constant. The operating values of VCE and IB determine the operating point of the amplifier. If a small sinusoidal voltage with amplitude Vs is superposed on the DC base bias by connecting the source of that signal in the series with VBB supply, then the base current will have the sinusoidal variation superimposed on the value of IB. As a consequence, the collector current also will have sinusoidal variation superimposed on the value of IC, producing in turn corresponding change in the value of VO. We can measure the AC variation across the input and output terminals by blocking the DC voltage by large capacitors. In the description of the amplifier given above, we have not considered any AC signal. In general, amplifiers are used to amplify alternating signals. Now let us superimpose an AC input signal VI to be amplified on the bias VBB DC. As shown in the figure, the output is taken between the collector and the ground. The working of an amplifier can be easily understood. If we first assume that Vi is equal to 0, then apply Kirchhoff's law to the output loop, we get Vbe plus Vi is equal to Vbe plus IBRB plus delta IB into capital RB plus small ri. The change in the VBE can be related to the input resistance small ri and the change in IB hence is VI is equals to delta IB into capital RB plus small ri is equals to R delta IB. The change in IB causes a change in IC. We define a parameter beta AC which is similar to the beta DC defined in equation 14.11 as beta AC is equals to delta IC divided by delta IB is equals to IC by IB which is also known as the AC current gain AI. Usually, beta AC is close to the beta DC in the linear region of the output characteristics. The change in IC due to the change in IB causes a change in VCE and the voltage drop across the resistor RL because VCC is fixed. These changes are given by equation 14.15 as 
डेल्टा वी सी सी इज इक्वल टू डेल्टा वी सी ई प्लस आर एल डेल्टा आई सी इज इक्वल टू जीरो वी ओ इज इक्वल टू डेल्टा वी सी ई इज इक्वल टू माइनस बीटा ए सी इन टू आर एल इन टू डेल्टा आई बी द वोल्टेज गेन इज ए वी इज इक्वल टू वी ओ अपॉन वी आई इज इक्वल टू माइनस बीटा ए सी इन टू आर एल बाई आर The negative sign represents the output voltage is opposite with the phase with the input voltage. From the discussion of the transistor characteristics, you have seen that there is a current gain beta AC in the CE configuration. Here we have also seen the voltage gain AV. Therefore the power gain AB can be expressed as the product of the current gain and voltage gain. Mathematically, AP is equals to beta AC into AV since beta AC and AV are greater than 1 we get AC power gain however it should be realized that transistor is not a power generating device the energy for higher AC power at the output is supplied by the battery feedback amplifier and transistor oscillator In an amplifier we have seen that a sinusoidal input is given which appears as a amplified signal in the output this means that an external input is necessary to sustain ac signal in the output for an amplifier in an oscillator we get ac output without any external input signal in other words the output in an oscillator is self sustained to attain this the amplifier is taken a portion of the output power is returned back that is the feedback to the input in phase with the starting power this process is termed as the positive feedback shown in the figure the feedback can be achieved by inductive coupling through mutual inductance or lc or rc networks different types of oscillators essentially use different methods of coupling the output to the input that is the feedback network apart from the resonant circuit for obtaining oscillation at a particular frequency for understanding the oscillator action we consider the circuit shown in figure 14.33b in which the feedback is accomplished by inductive coupling from the coil winding t1 to another coil winding t2 note that the coils t2 and t1 are wound on the same core and hence they inductively coupled through the mutual inductance as in an amplifier the base emitter junction is forward biased while the base collector junction is reverse biased detailed biasing circuits actually have been omitted for simplicity Let us try to understand how oscillations are built. Suppose switch S1 is put on to the apply the power bias for the first time. Obviously a surge of the collector current flows in the transistor. This current flows through the coil T2 where the terminals are numbered 3 and 4. This current does not reach the full amplitude instantaneously but increase from X to Y as shown in figure. The inductive coupling between the coil T2 and the coil T1 now causes a current to flow in the emitter circuit. Note that it is actually its feedback from input to output. As a result of this positive feedback, this current also increases from x dash to y dash. The current in T2 connected to the collector circuit acquires the value y when the transistor becomes saturated. This means that maximum collector current is flowing and can increase no further. Since there is no further change in the collector current, the magnetic field around T2 ceases to grow. As soon as the field becomes static, there will be no further feedback from T2 to T1. Without continued feedback, the emitter currents begin to fall. Consequently, collector currents decreases from Y towards Z. However, The decrease of the collector current causes the magnetic field to decay around the coil T2. Thus T1 is now seeing a decaying field in the T2 opposite from what it saw when the field was growing in the initial start operation. 
This causes a further decrease in the emitter current till it reaches Z dash when the transistor is cut off. This means that both IE and IC cease to flow. Therefore, the transistor has reverted back to its original state. When the power was first switched on, the whole process now repeats itself. That is, the transistor is driven to saturation, then to cut off and then back to saturation. The time for change from saturation to cut off and back is determined by the constants of the tank circuit or tuned circuit, inductance L of the coil T2 and C connected in parallel to it. The resonance frequency nu of this tuned circuit determines the frequency at which the oscillator will oscillate. Nu is equals to 1 by 2 pi under root LC. In the circuit in figure 14.33b, the tank or tuned circuit is connected in the collector side. Hence, it is known as tuned collector oscillator. If the tuned circuit is on the base side, it will be known as tuned base oscillator. There are many other types of tank circuits, say RC or the feedback circuits giving different types of oscillators like Colpit oscillator, Hartley oscillator and RC oscillator. Digital Electronics and Logic Gates In electronic circuits like amplifier oscillator introduced to you in the earlier sections, the signal current or voltage has been in the form of continuous, time-varying voltage or current. Such signals are called continuous or analog signals. A typical analog signal is shown in figure 14.34a. Figure 14.34b shows a pulse waveform in which only discrete values of the voltage are possible. It is convenient to use binary numbers to represent such signals. A binary number has only two digits, 0 and 1. In digital electronics, we use only these two levels of voltage as shown in figure 14.34b. Such signals are called digital signals. In digital circuits, only two values represented by 0 or 1 of the input and the output voltage are permissible. This section is intended to provide the first step in our understanding of digital electronics. We shall restrict our study to some basic building blocks of the digital electronics called the logic gates, which process the digital signals in a specific manner. Logic gates are used in calculators, digital watches, computers, robots, industrial control systems, and in telecommunication. A light switch in your house can be used as an example of a digital circuit. The light is either on or off depending on the switch position. When the light is on, the output value is 1. When the light is off, the output value is 0. The inputs are the positions of the light switch. The switch is placed either in the on or off position to activate the light. Logic Gates A gate is a digital circuit that follows a certain logical relationship between the input and the output voltage. Therefore, they are generally known as logic gates. Gate because they control the flow of information. The five common logic gates used are NOT, AND, OR, NAND, NOR. Each logic gate is indicated by a symbol and its function is defined by a truth table that shows all possible input logic level combinations with their respective output logic levels. Truth table help us understand the behavior of the logic gates. These logic gates can be realized using semiconductor devices. 1. NOT gate. This is the most basic gate with one input and one output. It produces a one input if the output is zero and vice versa. That is, it produces an inverted version of the input at its output. This is why it is known as the inverter. The commonly used symbol together with the truth table for this gate is given in the figure 14.35. 2. OR gate. An OR gate has two or more inputs with one output. The logic symbol and the truth table are shown in the figure 14.36. The output Y is 1 when either input A or input B or both are 1. That is, if any of the input is high, the input is high. Apart from carrying out the above mathematical logical operation, this gate can be used for modifying the pulse waveform. 3. AND gate. An AND gate has two or more inputs and one output. 
The output y of the AND gate is 1 only when input A and the input B both are 1. The logic symbol and the truth table for the gate are given by figure 14.38. Fourth, the NAND gate. NAND gate is the AND gate followed by a NOT gate. If the input A and B are both 1, the output Y is not 1. The gate gets its name from this NOT AND behavior. Figure 14.40 shows the symbol and truth table of NAND gate. NAND gates are also called the universal gates since by using these gates you can realize other basic gates like OR, AND and NOT. 5. NOR gate it has two or more inputs and one output. The NOR application applied after OR gate is known as the NOR gate. Its output Y is 1 only when both the inputs A and B are 0. That is neither one or both inputs are 1. The symbol and the truth table for NOR gate is given in figure 14.42. NOR gates are considered as universal gates because you can obtain all gates like AND, OR, NOT by using the NOR gates. Integrated circuits The conventional method of making circuits is to choose components like diodes, transistor, R, L, C, etc. and connect them by soldering wires in a desired manner. In spite of the miniaturization, Introduced by the discovery of the transistors, such circuits were still bulky. Apart from this, such circuits were less reliable and less shockproof. This concept of fabricating an entire circuit consisting of many passive components like R and C and active devices like diode and transistor on a small single block or chip of a semiconductor have revolutionized the electronic technology. Such a circuit is known as the integrated circuit. The most widely used technology is the monolithic integrated circuit. The word monolithic is a combination of two Greek words, monos meaning single, lithos means stone. This in effect means that entire circuit is formed on a single silicon crystal or chip. The chip dimensions are as small as 1 mm into 1 mm or it could be even smaller. Figure 14.43 shows a chip in its protective plastic case, partly removed to reveal the connections coming out from the chip to the pins that enables it to make external connections. Depending on the nature of the input signal, ICs can be used and grouped into two categories A. Linear or Analog IC B. Digital IC the linear ICs process the analog signals with change smoothly and continuously over a range of values between a maximum and a minimum. The output is more or less directly proportional to the input, that is, it varies linearly with the output. One of the most useful linear ICs is the operational amplifier. The digital ICs process signals that have only two values. They contain circuits such as logic gates. Depending upon the level of integration, that is, the number of circuit components or logic gates, the ICs are termed as small scale integration (SSI) logic gates with less than or equal to 10. Medium scale integration MSI logic gates less than or equal to 100 large scale integration LSI logic gates equal to or less than 1000 very large scale integration VLSI logic gates more than 1000 the technology of fabrication is very involved but very large scale industrial production have made them very inexpensive Summary 1. Semiconductors are basic materials used in present solid-state electronic devices like diode, transistor, ICs, etc. 2. Lattice structure and the atomic structure of constituent elements decide whether a particular material will be insulator, metal or semiconductor. 3. Metals have low resistivity, insulators have very high resistivity while semiconductors have intermediate values of resistivity. Fourth, semiconductors are elemental as well as compound. Five, pure semiconductors are called intrinsic semiconductors. The presence of charge carriers 
is an intrinsic property of the material and these are obtained as a result of thermal excitation. The number of electrons N E is equal to number of holes N H in the intrinsic conductor. Holes are essentially electron vacancies with an effective positive charge. Sixth, the number of charge carriers can be changed by doping of a suitable impurity in pure semiconductors. Such semiconductors are known as intrinsic semiconductors. These are of two types, P-type and N-type. Seventh, in N-type semiconductor, NE is much much greater than NH. In P-type semiconductor, NH is much much greater than NE. Eighth, N-type semiconducting, SI or GE is obtained by doping with pentavalent atoms like while P-type silicon or germanium can be obtained by doping with trivalent atoms. Ninth, NE into NH is equals to NI square in all cases. Further, the material possess an overall charge neutrality. Tenth, there are two distinct bands of the energies called the valence band and the conduction band in which the electrons in a material lie. Valence band energies are low as compared to the conduction band energies. All energy levels in the valence band are filled while energy levels in the conduction band may be fully empty or partially filled. The electrons in the conduction band are free to move in a solid and are responsible for the gap e.g. between the top of the valence band EV and the bottom of the conduction band AC. The electrons from the valence band can be excited by heat, light or electrical energy to the conduction band and hence produce a change in the current flowing in a semiconductor. 11. For insulators e.g. more than 3 electron volt, for semiconductors e.g. is 20.2 electron volt to 3 electron volt while for metals e.g. is equals to 0. 12. PN junction is the key to all semiconductor devices. When such a junction is made, a depletion layer is formed consisting of immobile iron cores devoid of their electrons or holes. This is responsible for a junction potential barrier. 13. By changing the external applied voltage, junction barriers can be changed. In forward bias, N side is connected to the negative terminal of the battery and P side is connected to the positive. The barrier is decreased while the barrier increases in the reverse bias. Hence, forward bias current is more while it is very small in a PN junction diode. 14. Diode can be used for rectifying an AC voltage, restricting the AC voltage to one direction with help of a capacitor or a suitable filter. A DC voltage can be obtained. 15. There are some special purpose diodes. 16. Zener diode is one such special purpose diode. In the reverse bias, after a certain voltage, the current suddenly increases breakdown voltage in a Zener diode. This property has been used to obtain voltage regulation. 17. PN junctions have also been used to obtain many photonic or optoelectronic devices where one of the participating entity is photon. A. Photodiodes in which the photon excitation results in a change of reverse saturation current which helps us to measure light intensity. B. Solar cells which convert photon energy into electricity. C. Light emitting diode and diode laser in which electron excitation by a bias voltage results in generation of light. 18. Transistor is an NPN or a PNP junction device. The central block, thin and light doped, is called a base while the other electrodes are emitter and collectors. The emitter base junction is forward biased while the collector base junction is reverse biased. 19. The transistor can be connected in such a manner that either C or E or B is common to the both input and output. This gives three configurations in which transistor can be used, common emitter, common collector, common base. The plot between IC and VCE for fixed IB is called output characteristics, while plot between IB and VBE with fixed VCE is called the input characteristics. The important transistor parameter for CE configuration are input resistance RI, 
output resistance RO, current amplification factor beta. Ri is equals to delta VBE by delta IB. RO is equals to delta VCE by delta IC. Beta is equals to delta IC by delta IB. 20. Transistor can be used as an amplifier and oscillator. In fact, an oscillator can also be considered as self-sustained amplifier in which a part of output is fed back to the input in the same phase. The voltage gain of the transistor amplifier in common emitter configuration is AV is equals to beta RC by RB. 21. When the transistor is used in the cutoff or saturation state, it acts as a switch. 22. There are some special circuits which handle the digital data consisting of 0 and 1 levels. This forms the subject of the digital electronics. 23. Important digital circuits performing special logic operations are the logic gates. These are OR, AND, NOT, NAND and NOR gates. 24. In the modern day circuit, many logic gates or the circuits are integrated in a single chip known as the ICs. Points to ponder. 1. The energy bands IC or IV in the semiconductors are space delocalized which means that these are not located in any specific place inside the solid. These energies are the overall averages. When you see a picture in which AC or EV are drawn as straight lines, then they should be respectively taken simply at the bottom of conduction band energy levels and top of valence band energy levels. 2. In elemental semiconductors, silicon or germanium, the n-type or p-type semiconductors are obtained by introducing dopants as defects. In compound semiconductors, the change in the relative stoichiometric ratio can also change the type of semiconductor. 3. In transistor, the base region is both narrow and lightly doped, otherwise the electrons or the holes coming from the input side, say emitter in configuration, CE configuration, will not be able to reach the collector. Fourth, we have described an oscillator on a positive feedback amplifier for stable oscillations. The voltage feedback VFB from the output voltage VO should be such that after amplification A it should again become VO. If a fraction beta dash is feedback, then VFB is equals to VO into B dash and after amplification its value A VO into B dash should be equal to VO. This means that the criteria for stable oscillation to be sustained is A B dash is equals to 1. This is known as Berkhausen criteria. 5. In an oscillator, the feedback is in the same phase, positive feedback. If the feedback voltage is in the opposite phase, negative feedback, the gain is less than 1. And it can never work as oscillator. It will be an amplifier with reduced gain. However, the negative feedback also reduces noise and distortion.